Booyah! Chef teching, and I have a gourmet meal for you guys today. Your mouths will water, your stomachs will be so elated, they will literally jump out of your body, grow a face, smile, and then return so that it can digest this amazing dish of sheer excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the Popped Tart. All right, everybody, and here we are, the last core member of the Straw Hat crew, Sanji Vinsmoke, you know, and the reason why Sanji ended up being the last one I'm discussing, just shitty luck of the draw, although I am kind of happy about that in a sense, because we found out a lot of stuff about Sanji's character during the most recent arc, the arc that we're currently in, Totland, so the fact that he was the last one I discussed actually gave us a little bit more leeway um, since I started these discussion series way back in uh, March, I think I started with Usopp's video, and uh, here we are, I mean, it's it's been a ride, it's been very extensive to get these videos out, and I know some of them have been delayed, but thank you for for bearing with me on that um this isn't exactly the last video because i want to do a video about the straw hats ships you know the going merry and the thousand sunny uh and i also want to do a video about vivi now i know vivi's not a real member of the straw hat crew she hasn't traveled with the crew since alabasta but she was more of a, like a member of the crew during her time i mean there's there's people that travel with the straw hats all the time like like conjuro and law even you know but they're not really members of the crew they're just kind of like people that travel with the crew uh but vivi for a long time there, we looked at Vivi like it was very possible she could have joined. So I'm going to do a video about her. A lot of people want that. But today's video is going to be about the chef of the Straw Hat crew, Sanji Vinsmoke. So let's start it off like all the others with his depressing ass backstory. Although this is a... This is an exception to that. We don't just get one depressing as fuck backstory. We get two. Because I guess Odo, when he first introduced him, he gave us a depressing backstory, but then later on in the story, he's like, ah, oh, man, this this just isn't good enough. This isn't as big as a tearjerker. You know, after you get to Robin and Brooke and their backstories, you're like, oh, we need to we need to amp this up a couple notches. So let's let's go back even further in Sanji's past and give him a, give him a very proper depressing backstory and some uh, estranged family members. Yeah, let's, let's throw that in in there. All right, well, in terms of his first backstory, you know, uh, the Straw Hat Pirates, they were in need of a cook. That's one of the major things that you need on a ship if you want to traverse the most dangerous ocean in the world, the Grand Line. Uh, now, Nami had the ability to cook. She could cook fairly well, but in case of, you know, actually needing somebody to make sure you get the proper ingredients and, you know, proper nutrition and everything like that, somebody that can really take, you know, you know, stuff that really isn't all that great and make it into a gourmet meal, they didn't have anybody like that. So, uh, Johnny, when Yosaku was, was, was the method this point and they were like hey let's go to the baratier it's the seafaring restaurant it's actually very close to the grand line and hey even mihawk is purported to eat there every now and then and you know that got zoro's swords all stiff and hard and ready to go so they all go to the baratier sanji was working as the sous chef at the baratier so he was like the second in command of the kitchen uh the commander of the kitchen the head chef that would be zef who was uh, sanji's father figure and his mentor throughout his formative years um however though because a lot of the staff i guess left sanji was also working as like a busboy and as a waiter and everything like that, but he was the sous chef of the restaurant, so his he, his skill in the kitchen is pretty much unparalleled right next to Zeph. Um, anyway, though, w uh, eventually Don Krieg's pirate armada shows up, and they end up trashing the restaurant, we find out about Sanji's backstory. When Sanji was a, a kid around 10 years old, he was working on a uh, cruise ship called the Orbit. It was just like a normal cruise ship that would just take, you know, normal citizens of the One Piece world around, you know, and eat gourmet food. Um, and Sanji's thing was that he was disgusted with the other cooks on the orbit eating leftover food like so some rich fuck would come in and you know leave half of their steak uneaten and then the the, the the cooks in the kitchen would be like oh man look at all this extra food and they would eat all their leftovers and Sanji was like how dare you eat that disgusting shit you know you're you're humans you're eating like animals you know eating the scraps off of the of the plates and they were like Sanji you know you'll understand when you're older or whatever you know you take what you can get basically um, and he found out about that lesson a lot earlier than he figured because Zeph's pirate crew the 
Cook pirates. They attack the orbit. Uh, there was a giant storm. Both of their pirate ship, I mean, the pirate ship of the Cook pirates in the orbit, they sink. And the only people that were known to survive this were Zeph and Sanji. They wash ashore on an island um, that was too high up for them to fish, and they couldn't, uh, they, they could jump down into the ocean, but they wouldn't be able to get back up, and there was no plant life on the rock that they landed on. So the only thing that they could do is just sit on this rock and wait for a ship to pass by to rescue them. Now, Zeph had procured two bags of what he called food. You know, one bag for Sanji, one bag for him. The bag for Sanji, though, was very small, and the bag for Zeph was, like, giant. And so Sanji took this to mean that, oh, you go, you, you're taking all the food for yourself, and you're leaving me with just this little amount. And Zeph's you know, only answer to this is, like, well, I'm an adult, so I eat more. Now go and sit at the other end of this rock. Don't bother talking to me. Don't move around too much. It'll burn too much energy. Ration your food. Wait for a ship, and only come over here when you see one basically. So, Sanji's first impression of Zeph is like, basically, fuck you old man! You show up, you wreck our freaking cruise ship, and then you don't even, you, you give me a niggling amount of food while you keep all of it, and you're telling me not to move. Fuck off! Well, anyway... Sanji goes over to his side of the rock, and he's like, all right, he's very optimistic. He's like, okay, um, you know, if I ration out this food, it should last like 20 days or some such, and there's bound to be a, a, a cruise ship crossing by, and hey, Orbit, we don't even know if Orbit sank or not. Maybe they'll still be around, whatever. So um, they end up waiting on this rock for something over a, like over a month. I think it was like something like 50 or 60 days they were stranded on this rock. Uh, Sanji eventually, you know, depletes all his food stock, uh, and he gets down to like the last piece of moldy bread, and he's just like, he remembers back when he's like complaining that his other fellow cooks on the orbit were eating leftover food. And now here he is chomping down on moldy bread. So he feels like really how stupid he was and how valuable food can be in a time of crisis like this. Um, um, eventually he's resorted to like a withered husk of what he is. Um, there was water on the island or rather there were like, there were like crevices in the rock. So whenever it rained, you know, it would collect water and you know, you could drink water that way. Uh, but aside from that, there was no food or anything like that, or not even really any shelter. Um, but anyway, finally Sanji gets to the point on the island where he just can't take it anymore. He's just to the point of hunger where it's just like, I will literally kill something. Do you know, I will kill another human being to not die essentially. So he takes out a, a kitchen knife that he had and he goes over to Zeph, um, planning on killing him and taking his food. And he notices that the giant bag that Zeph had was still there as if he hadn't eaten a single thing. And so he cuts it open with the knife and it's revealed that it wasn't food at all. It was just treasure this whole time. Zeph didn't have any food. Zeph gave all the food to Sanji that he managed to save. And so Sanji's like, wait a second. Well, how did you survive for so long? Like 50, 60 days without any food. And that's when we find out the big grisly revelation that Zeph actually cut off his own fucking leg and then ate that in order to survive. Now, some of you might question that. Some of you might say, wait a second, I don't remember Zeph cutting off his own leg and eating it. I distinctly remember Zeph losing his leg when he was saving Sanji in the wreckage of the pirate ship in the orbit. Mandela effect, anyone? No, that's just a difference between anime and manga. In the manga, it's clearly stated that, yeah, Zeph ate his own fucking leg in order to survive. In the anime, that was a little bit too grisly for the audience, so they changed it around to mean, so now it was just, um... Zeph lost his leg in the wreckage and I guess just managed to survive the entire time without any food, even though that goes beyond. But Zeph was like a superhuman kind of, he was really fucking strong in his day, so I guess he could he could endure it better than Sanji could, who was just a child at the time. Um, but yeah, so, so that was that was Sanji's backstory. Eventually a, a ship shows up and they get them off the uh, rock, and eventually uh, Zeph and Sanji open up the Baratier, which is the seafaring restaurant, because, you know, anybody that's like dying at sea, you know, oh, there's not just, uh, there's not just salvation, that's a gourmet restaurant. So that that's his backstory, and it seems like, all right, that's pretty depressing, but it's not super bad. I mean, yeah, he was almost dying of hunger and everything like that, but everything worked out at the end of the day. He grew up on the Baratier with Zeph, and Zeph was kind of a, a very strict uh, father figure, but he wasn't, like, unduly abusive to, to Sanji. He wasn't, like, a horrible person. Uh, he raised him up and just in, imported a lot of values into him. Sh Sanji's uh, chivalrous nature with women uh, and the way he presents himself, that's all because of Zeph 
that's uh, Zeph's teachings. And even in the you know the present storyline, Sanji states that because of the way that he was raised by Zeph, he cannot bring himself to kick a woman. It's not a matter of just I want to or I don't want to. It's just a matter of like I physically can't do it, just because all this you know the teachings that Zeph imparted of him, he just can't bring himself to do it like subconsciously. Um, but uh, you know when Sanji was leaving the Baratier with Luffy and uh, and Yosaku and everybody, he was very broken apart. He started crying. He bowed. And he's like, "Thank you, shitty geezer." You know, they always he always called him uh, geezer, and Zeph always called him you know like shitty eggplant. And it was a nice little back and forth. And you know, Zeph was kind of tearing up at this as well. And he's like, "Get out there, go on, leave leave the, the time to leave the nest and find the all blue." That's Sanji's goal is to find the all blue, this mythical sea where all the oceans of all the world collect together: the north, the south, the east, the west blue, the Grand Line. They all meet together, and all the fish from these seas meet. Um, you'd figure the only places that this would even be possible would be Reverse Mountain with Sanji's been at, and also Fishman Island, which also Sanji's been at, so that's kind of weird that they don't reference that. Like, if if you want a place where all the oceans meet, Fishman Island, it's the perfect spot, but whatever, okay, I'm sure Oda's gonna do something else with it. Maybe it's, like, underneath Reverse Mountain or some shit, or it is Reverse Mountain, I, I don't know. Well... Anyway, later on in the story, we find out more about Sanji's past, and this takes place before he was working on the orbit. Uh, so, Sanji's name is actually Sanji Vinsmoke, part of the Vinsmoke family. What's the deal with the Vinsmoke family? Well, they're like a bunch of Super Sentai Nazi people that are uh, from the North Blue originally, and the leader, the the, pa the patriarch of the family is Vinsmoke Judge, or Judgey, however you want to say it. I like to say Judgey, because there's very clearly like a naming scheme, like Sanji, Ichiji, Niji, Yonji, Judgey, you know, but if you just want to call him Judge, that's fine too. It is pretty badass, I will admit. Uh, and he's this towering dude with like giant hair, and he's also a scientist, and he developed all this really advanced technology for the, for the Vinsmoke family, also also, the, the German Double Six. The German Double Six is like the name of the military unit, but it's closely connected with the Vinsmoke family. Um, and uh, he worked with Dr. Vegapunk in his past, you know, so he had all this crazy technology like flying shoes and like rocket powered, you know, boots and everything like that. So, um, and, and, and the ships could like interconnect, like it was a movable country, basically. It was like all the ships are part of the country and then they can all connect together to make the nation of the German Double Six. Um, and their overarching goal is to unite the, nor the northern seas under one flag, the flag of the Germa, and uh, apparently this only went down for 66 days where they had control over the northern seas and then some other stuff went down and now the whole goal is trying for them to reclaim that throne that they once had and this passes down through the family until you eventually get to Judge. Now what Judge wanted to do because he was so adept at science and everything was he wanted to have uh, some, n he wanted to have kids but not just kids, he wanted to have genetically modified kids, you know GMO the shit out of this. So he was like, oh man, I'm gonna have badass kids that have like super iron skin and that can like bend steel and and are resistant to like poisons and shit. This is gonna be great. So uh, he marries uh, Sola, who is Sanji's mother, who is just a very, seems like a normal normal woman, very kind. Um, and then, you know, it introduces all these uh, like uh, genetic like therapy and like chemical like and shit into her, you know, where it like changes her body around so that whenever she gives birth, uh, the children that she gives birth to will be like these superhumans. Now, Sola didn't like this, that, you know, Judgey was modifying her in this way, so she downed like a shit ton of drugs to try to counteract the effects. Um, bottom line, it sort of kind of worked, not really. Um, Ichiji, Niji, and Yonji all ended up with no emotions when they were born, so they ended up being, you know, these emotionless creatures that would just basically attack and just laugh and, and not feel any sort of empathy or anything like that, even for their own kin. Um, now, now, Reiju, the only daughter, she ended up having uh, emotions, but she was still very much subservient to Judge. She couldn't go against an order given by Judge. And Sanji was the only one that actually turned out as like a normal human, where he had his own free will, he didn't have to listen to Judge, and also that he had his own emotions and shit like that. Uh, he ended up being fairly uh, human, although he does have still, you know, superhuman capabilities um, that we see throughout One Piece. So I would like to say that that's still part of like maybe the genetic modification. A lot of people think like he's eventually going to awaken that power. Hour, like he's gonna awaken like a like the steel skin armor and shit that they have. Um, I don't know about that. Maybe it's possible, um, but he'll still retain his emotions, and that's what really that his like levels of empathy. That's what really matters um, there, and that's what Sola wanted. Uh, Sola became very ill after giving birth because of all the drugs that she took to counteract the therapy. Um, 
so Sanji would constantly visit her, and that was like the light of Sola's life, because uh, her other sons didn't even really give a shit about their own mothers. That's pretty. That's pretty fucked up. Um, and that's where Sanji learned how to like. He wanted to cook. He wanted to cook for his mother. Uh, while he was part of the Vinsmoke family, he would read books about like the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia and about uh, the Adventures of Nolan the Liar. That was a popular book in the North Blue. So that's where he like like had an interest in books and uh, cooking. Whereas the other Vinsmoke siblings were all taught by Judgey to you know partake in warfare to learn how to fight and uh sanji kept falling behind he couldn't run as fast he wasn't as strong he didn't have the same level as endurance as all his other uh brothers and sisters so he was you know purported as a failure now here's the thing judge it's easy to look at judge because of the aesthetic of the the like there's so much about like the vin smoke family and the germa double six that harkens back to like nazi germany and um like evil organizations that are in fucking like super sentai and common rider you know everyone's wearing skulls and shit it's easy to look at judge as just like i'm an asshole sanji fuck you you're not as good as i want you to be i'm gonna kill you now it's easy to look at like that judge actually does have emotion and i think that's going to be more of a connection to sanji that he really wants to forget that's why he hates sanji so much is maybe because he reminds him a little of himself um but Judgey couldn't bring himself to do it. He couldn't bring himself to kill his own son, even though he was an absolute failure. And so, because of that, Judge did the only sensible thing. He locked Sanji up in the deepest dungeon in the, in the country, and he put a giant iron mask over his head, because... Actually, I can't really think of a reason why he put the iron mask on him. I think it was just to be a dick, really. It, it can't be just to stop him from screaming, because he was still screaming with the mask on. And they took it off when he was eating and everything, so I don't really know what the point of the Iron Mask was, other than to just draw a parallel with the man in the Iron Mask, which is the story, which is, you know, that's what they were going for, but... Yeah, Judge, Judge, Judge wasn't that big of a dick to, like, kill his son, but he, he was still a pretty big douche nugget. Like, let's not, let's not forget that, okay? Well, anyway, um, after being locked in the dungeon for a few weeks, you know, and they, they still allowed him to eat proper food. They weren't giving him slop. He could still read books and all that shit. It's just that Judge just didn't want any part of him. Just, just lock him down there. I don't want to see him. From now on, I only have four kids, basically. Uh, three, br uh, three sons and one daughter. Um, so they grew up and they started getting stronger and stronger. And the thing with the Vinsmoke siblings is that they could like develop an outer shell to grow up faster, uh, as opposed to Sanji. Um, eventually the Germa went from the North Blue to the East Blue to go and invade this other country. Um, their, their country was so advanced that they were on like these, like, like these giant snail ships that allowed them to actually traverse the entire Grand Line, just go up one side and down the other. So that's how Sanji got from North to East Blue, which is a big deal. No matter how you go from one blue to another i made a whole video about the geography of one piece and spoiler alert geography is everything but yeah um they get to the east blue they start invading this island sanji eventually gets free reiju frees him uh he has a little bit of a back and forth with judge uh because he wants to leave so he holds like a knife up to judge and he's like i'm out of here dad i'm leaving and you you can't stop me and judge is like oh oh jeez thank god I've been waiting for this forever. I just didn't have the heart to do it myself. Yeah, get the fuck out of here, Sanji. I don't want you. But, just to keep in mind, you are not part of this family. You don't tell people that you're a Vinsmoke. You don't tell people you're connected to the German Double Six. I don't want to hear your fucking name ever again. Get out here and just, I better never see you again. Just leave. You know, and so Sanji, that, that was probably even more crushing to Sanji. He was probably expecting some resistance, at least a little bit. Like, you know, like, Dad, I'm getting out of here and you can't stop me. And it's like, oh, Sanji, get back here. And I'm like, I'm free. But no, it was even worse than that. It was like, I'm getting out of here, Dad. I'm like, oh, good, leave. Fucking God, jeez, I hate you. Like, eh. So, sucks to be Sanji, really. That was that was sad. Um, he, uh, Reiju helps him escape. They get on, that's when he finds the orbit that was like more on the side of this island that the Germa just kind of let alone because it wasn't affiliated with the island they were attacking. So they're like, all right, like, Sanji, get on that boat, you know, just lay it low and try to find a family, try to find someone that actually loves you. Um, and then so Sanji left, and then that's how it connects back to the backstory that we find out at the beginning of the story with him working on the orbit and then Zeph and everything like that. So that's, that's Sanji's total backstory. Is it... The worst backstory out of all the Straw Hats? No, it's not. It, it really isn't. You know, like, 
is nobody really died it was like well sola died his mother uh which was pretty sad there but she was already very sickly it wasn't like she died in a really dramatic way like um like robin's uh mother did uh but she died because of what she did to her body in order for sanji to be born so i, I don't even know if sanji even really knows about that i don't even really know what the sacrifice that sola did so sanji could be born the way he was um, but, uh, it's still pretty damn depressing, and so it, it falls in suit. Now, does that mean we're gonna get a lot of redone versions of, like, Zoro's backstory, and that's gonna turn out to be even worse? I, I don't know, um, but, uh, it was interesting to learn more about Sanji's past, because when Sanji, Sanji growing up for me was my favorite straw hat until Frankie showed up. You know, he's pretty cool, is, is what I'm trying to get across here. He'll be walking toward an opponent, this, like, a guy that's, like, ten feet tall or something, like, I'm gonna kill you, Sanji. Sanji just all really cool and chill, the fucking jazz soundtrack cues up in the anime, like, da na 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 and takes out a freaking cigarette and just, uh, no, not a, not a lollipop, a cigarette, what is this, the four kids dub? Takes out a cigarette, just lights it really cool and just, you're dead, and then just beats the shit out of him with his, uh, with his, uh, feet. Um, so yeah, it's, smoking kills, kids, you shouldn't smoke. And Sanji, you're probably gonna have lung problems later on, but damn, do you make it look cool. Um, when, that, 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 you know what? People always bring that up. Like, you have to make sure to omit cigarettes uh, from, like, cartoons and stuff, like in the 4Kids dub, because they were afraid that kids were going to go and, like, have to smoke. And um, I have to say that when I saw Sanji, uh, I, I was like, well, I'm not smoking, but... It does look pretty cool when he does it. I will admit. I mean, you got you got to throw that out there. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, he, and then he switches between that cool, collective, like gentleman sort of demeanor. You know, he's always wearing. He's always dressed very finely in the suits and everything like that. He'll switch over to his uh, perverted nature whenever he sees a hot girl with huge tits, and he'll just. He's definitely a boob man. Sanji's definitely a boob man. You know, that's not even really a question there. Um, I don't think we've seen him ogle asses very much. No, wait, no, there was those two times. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that's just the case there, Sanji tit man. So I think we could, I think that's, you know, we can relate. I think that's why I had a connection with him when I was a kid. Um, and uh, so then he'll break out into his, you know, slovenly, kind of like the hearts popping out, start drooling like, oh, look at all the beauties. Um, until he got sent to Kamabaka Kingdom, which that uh, probably scarred him for life there. But uh, it, 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 that's what makes Sanji's character Sanji's character. You know, he could switch back and forth between the, you know, oh, hello there, beautiful ladies. I am the amazing cook on the straw hats and I will defend your honor until the day I die. Also, my God, look at the beautiful boobs on that one. <laughs> so that's, that's Sanji, whatever, he's cool. Now, on top of his perverted nature and his gentlemanly appearance, he is also, first and foremost, the chef of the Straw Hat crew, and he's whipping up gourmet meals for the entire crew to enjoy. Uh, of course, in Luffy's case, all he really needs to win him over is just, you know, meat, and that's all. Uh, but in the case with, uh, like, Nami and Robin, he's very careful with what he prepares. He makes sure to use only the top and finest and fresh ingredients for them, all the leftover ingredients that might look like they're going bad. He just, you know, shovels down Luffy or Usopp's you know, food holes, you know. Um, but he's very careful when preparing food for Nami and Robin. He'll be like, oh, here's this, this amazing drink that I made for you guys, or here's this pie or this quiche or this amazing, you know, um, creme fraiche covered... I don't know, I'm not a fucking cook, but you know what I mean, he's awesome. The only thing is, I wish that they would show more of Sanji cooking. You know, like, uh, you know how they do it in, like, Black Butler, whenever, like, uh, Sebastian reveals another dish, and like, ah, Master Phantom Hive, here is, um, a delicious, you know, uh, Earl Grey tea with a croissant made from this kind of material. You know, like, all this kind of, like, very specific things, like, if they could do that in the One Piece world to actually showcase Sanji's, like, um, you know, uh, cooking prowess, that would be cool. Uh, and I think they do do that a little bit at the beginning like what he does with his cooking but at the uh like as the story progresses it's more of just like here's just you know beautiful food that i just prepared for all you guys and it looks tasty and good but um he's the chef that's his thing so maybe go into a little bit more detail there in fact i would love to see like i, I don't know where you could fit this in oda maybe if you could do this like whenever the all the intense scene because it's been kind of non-stop with the story arcs it's been like you know punk hazard leads right into dressrosa which leads right into zoe which leads right into to Totland, but 
if if you're in between like story arcs, it would be cool to see like bonus chapters of One Piece that just show like this is Luffy's day on the Straw Hat crew. This is Sanji's day on the Thousand Sunny preparing food and everything like that. This is Frankie's day just tinkering with shit. I mean, that would be kind of cool. I would read it. That would be really interesting because we don't really get to see the Straw Hats interacting as a crew on the Sunny all that much. We get to see it on the anime um, more often, like during like little filler scenes and stuff, but not really so much in the manga. Um, and they, they they're they're set up as such like a close-knit family, and yet we don't really get to see them acting as a family unit a lot. So stuff like that would be cool to see more in the um, in, in the series. But aside from that, yes, he is a brilliant cook. Um, because he is a cook and he has to use his hands to properly prepare meals, uh, he, just, he considers them sacred. Like, his hands are sacred. He can't use them for anything other than cooking and also probably, you know, loving the ladies. Um, so in order to fight, you know, the very strong opponents that could end up him getting uh, severely injured, uh, he uses his legs to fight. Because, uh, as Zeph put it, even if, even if you lose a leg, um, you can at least still cook. You can still create using your hands. Um, so that's how Sanji adapted his uh, black leg uh, style when fighting, and he names all of his techniques after uh, in, in French in French terms for like food and various like locations on the body. Like I know the one that he uses most often is uh, uh, couillère, which means neck. I probably butchered that horribly. Was it couillère or like cousse? I, I forget. I'm not, I didn't take French in high school. I took Spanish and I still didn't learn shit from it. So I'm not one to look forward to when you're, when you're talking about French or foreign languages. Um, but that, that's like the naming scheme of his different techniques. Sometimes he'll name them after like, uh, his opponents having really bad table manners. Like when his, uh, he kicked that fucking banana, banana gator that was, uh, that crocodile had, it was the anti-manner kick course and just like one solid kick and just bam, knocks this thing into the fucking ceiling. This this giant alligator thing which was like you know like 20 times larger than Sanji and he just like kicks it up with like one foot so um, this is this is the power of Sanji's fighting style so I would say maybe a little bit of the Vince Smoke gene did get into him uh, as he grew older there and he got a little tougher that way so now I want to get into the relationships with the crew now like I said in previous videos I've kind of already addressed because Sanji was the last one on this list I kind of already addressed a lot of the relationships like for instance I already addressed Zoro's relationship with Sanji in Zoro's video, but I'm going to touch upon it here because it is a big deal. Um, so the rivalry between Zoro and Sanji, that actually started in Little Garden. Um, it's, it's hard to remember, but before Little Garden, Sanji and Zoro didn't really have, they were kind of indifferent toward one another. Um, they had a few snide comments back and forth and everything like that. Like, I think when Sanji first met Nami and he was like swooning over Nami, I think like Zoro had like a wise crack to make about that or whatever, but they weren't like, they weren't like looking at each other like, I'm going to fucking kill you. I'm going to fucking kill you, you know, dartboard brow, you know, moss head, you know, that kind of shit. Uh, that didn't happen until Little Garden when the two um, had an agreement to do a hunting contest, like whoever brings back the bigger game wins. Uh, and they never really solved that issue because they brought back two dinosaurs and you could make an argument like, well, mine's bigger because of the horns. Well, mine's bigger because it's taller, you know, whatever. And so oh, the, oh, the tail's longer or some shit. And it's like, that doesn't count. And it's just like, so they never really resolved who won that hunting contest. And from that day, onward it was just like the, the constant rivalry between the two but it isn't a bad thing um, it, it's not that they don't give a shit about each other you know when Sanji had to return to to, to Totland to go back to the Vinsmoke family um, Zoro was a little bit you know he didn't he didn't show it he wasn't like breaking out in tears like Sanji but he actually did care about him and I think the same thing that happened with Zoro like if someone went up to, to, to Sanji and said Zoro had to leave and he might never come back I don't think so I mean Sanji might put up a tough facade like Oh, whatever. But in reality, he'd be like, yeah, all right, all right, we need to go get him back. We need to go get him back. And that's, hell, that was even showcased brilliantly um, at the end of Thriller Bark, whenever Zoro was about to take on the pain from Kuma's bubble. Sanji shows up and is every bit as determined to do it. Not just to save Luffy, but also to save Zoro a little bit. Now, you could say it was all for Luffy's sake. You know, we got to make sure that the captain survives. But Sanji even says, like, you know, you're that quick to give up on your dreams of becoming the greatest swordsman. You know, the Pirate King's going to need the greatest swordsman in the world. You know, I'll give up 
my life there. And Zoro just kind of like nudges him to the side. He knocks him out with his swords. Uh, but that still, I think, says something about Sanji's character, not only for Luffy, but also like, I'm not going to let Zoro take this either. If Sanji really didn't like Zoro, if they really did like have a mutual just disdain for each other, um, you know, Sanji would have just let him go and do it. Uh, but that's not the di that's not the relationship that they have here. It's not. It's just a rivalry to push them to get stronger. They're both the same age. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of, you know, you know, thing there. It's like, you know, you're tougher than me. Well, I'm tougher than you. You know, just just some like banter to get stronger, you know, and that's that's the thing that kind of drives them the most. And in terms of the top fighters on the crew, Sanji is usually referred to as number three in the top three. Uh, it goes Luffy, Zoro, and then Sanji. Although I would say Luffy and Zoro might be closer together in terms of power. Um, Sanji is like, if, if this is like Luffy and Zoro, like right here, maybe switching back and forth every now and then, Sanji would be like right here. You know, like one tier below that. Um... Now, a serious fight between Sanji and Zoro, that would be a fucking spectacle, like a serious balls-out fight, uh, which we've actually never seen in the story. Even, even, like a, even like a match like what Zoro and Luffy had at Whiskey Peak. Uh, I don't think they were actually trying to kill each other, but they were still fighting. You know, we haven't even gotten really anything like that with Zoro and Sanji. I think it would be pretty obvious that Zoro would come out the victor there just because of his sword techniques, and Sanji doesn't rely on swords. He relies on just his, his kicks and his hockey. Uh, uh, Sanji is the most gifted at observation hockey, so hey, maybe he might be able to dodge Zoro's slashes and everything like that, but still, man, I think one solid hit from Zoro's fucking, you know, armament hockeyed up, uh, you know, like, you know, Poundaho or, you know, Ichidai Sunsen, Daisen Sakai, I, I don't think Sanji's gonna be walking away from that shit, so I, I think there is a clear difference in power there, um, but Sanji, make no mistake, is still very strong, and his hockey is very adept at, at observation and things like of, of that nature. Now, that's that's the relationship with Zoro. Um, when it gets to Nami, I want to discuss this. Now, look, this is going to go into a little bit of my own personal feelings for the situation. But whenever I view Sanji and Nami's relationship, whenever I actually look at them, I really can't help but think that, yeah, they do have like a mutually love for each other that's that's what i feel now from sanji's end it's very obvious you know because he's like swooning over her constantly you know and i think what well, wasn't it like when sanji first joined the crew he said like uh, like the 98.72 percent it was a weird fucking number it was a very specific number that has a decibel point he was like the 98.72 percent of the reason i joined this crew was because nami was on it um very specific number but that's the i guess the other 1.18 percent was because luffy you know drove him to find his dreams or whatever but the other reason was because of Nami. Um, and it's very easy just to look at the relationship between them as, like, Sanji is so perverted, he's only interested in Nami's body, and he's constantly just swooning over her tits and shit, and Nami's constantly like, you know, get away from me, and, he, you know, he'll, she'll, like, get away and slap him or hit him, you know, in a comedic fashion every now and then, um, and, and, and stuff like that. I think it's, it's easy to look at it in that sense, uh, but I don't. I, I view it as something like he'd actually actually is in love with her and it goes beyond just her body um and and all the shit that she's been through in her past maybe Sanji can relate with it a little bit um you know Sanji lost a mother uh Nami lost her mother uh and the situation growing up was pretty tough for them uh Nami was basically a prisoner with Arlong Sanji was a prisoner from his own family so I think that there's like a connection there like we've kind of been through similar shit um and after Nami has found out this history now, you know, with the whole thing with Sanji and what happened with him, um, maybe she'll begin to open up a little bit more to him. Uh, and I don't think Nami's ever directly, like, I, 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 she gets annoyed whenever there's, like, a serious issue at hand here. Like, all hands on deck, there's a fucking storm coming. If we're not careful, we're all gonna die. And then Sanji's like, that's great, Nami Swan, you're so beautiful. I'm like, okay, that's great. Can you fucking hurry up and grab the sails? I don't want to die today, you know? So yeah, she gets rather annoyed in those kind of situations, um, but I, I think she finds him attractive. I think that, you know, the fact, hey, he can cook, you know, that's that's an attractive quality that a guy could have. You know, he could cook gourmet food for you. Um, 
And I don't think she, you know, he's annoying every now and then, but his overall personality and his, like, his chivalrous nature and everything like that, I think Nami kind of admires that. I think that she really does. Um, that he just can't kick a woman no matter what. And there was that scene when he got defeated by Khalifa for that reason. You know, he couldn't kick Khalifa, so he got turned into that soap, you know, that slippery version of Sanji, got knocked down. You have this moment where Nami kind of looks at him and just, it's like, really? That chivalry is really going to be the death of you. Um, and I think that, that was a very really interesting moment there between the two um when sanji leaves on zo uh when he goes with beijay to return to uh the the vinsmoke family there um you have chopper and brooke and they're kind of upset of it as well but so uh, nami is completely broken up by this she is in tears about Sanji leaving about this you know she like goes up and hugs Luffy and begins bawling her eyes out like like keep in mind they're happy to see Luffy in the team because they've been separated for like a few weeks and everything and they were fighting Doflamingo and everything so she's happy to see Luffy but that happiness is like immediately because she has to tell them all about Sanji now and what happened and that he left and he e even though he left a note that said I'll be back Nami is like heart like is like heartbroken and worried about him. Like like I can't believe he left. I don't know if he's coming back. I'm so worried about him. And um even though even though they're going into Yonko territory, even though this is dangerous and they might not be able to survive and they might be able to not be able to come out of it alive, and Nami is not one of the strongest members of the Straw Hat crew, she still goes. She volunteers to go with Luffy and Brooke and Chopper to go to Totland to get Sanji back, even though they're invading the territory of one of the strongest pirates in the world. Um, she volunteers. Now, you know, to their credit, you know, Brooke volunteers too. So does, so does Chopper. But, you know, Brooke and Chopper, they can handle themselves. Like, Brooke handled a fucking, uh, a confrontation with Big Mom herself. Chopper's got Monster Point to go on. Yeah, Nami's got her climb attack. She's got her skills with that. But she doesn't have, like, some crazy, awesome, badass form that she could resort to. She's got her climb attacked. She's pretty athletic. She's pretty fit. Um, she can run fair distances and stuff like that. But her, I mean, if she gets hit with, like, a fucking lightning bolt, she's, she's fucked. You know, she can't, she can't get back up after that like Chopper or Brooke probably could. She's just a little bit more, you know, she doesn't have the same level of, like, stamina and, and toughness that the other crew members do. Uh, she relies heavily on her own quick wits and using the climb attack and everything like that. But even then, she still went so that's my opinion on their those two relationships i find them like th th they they should be a couple you know i know i know that seems like rather simple and, and just straightforward i know there's people that ship you know nami and luffy for some reason and nami with other characters but i really feel like in this situation if oda's gonna do any romantic thing of it at all like ending out the story of one piece and then if they're actually gonna have couples and everything which i don't even know if oda might not even go down that route but if he's gonna do that i think it's gonna be sanji and nami getting together i think they would be a good i think they would be a good couple but that's just me right so that's how that goes and oh i almost forgot about that holy shit i, I would have never forgiven myself if i forgot to bring that up <laughs> so on punk hazard you all, you all know where this is going on punk hazard when sanji gets body swapped into nami's body because of you know law's devil fruit ability you know sanji gets put in nami's body nami eventually get nami first gets put into frankie's body but eventually nami does get put into sanji's body uh when that when that body swap thing occurs you know what I think this is also a big tell for Sanji's true feelings for Nami as well as with his like his own personality and his like his chivalrous nature like all right let me present to you a hypothetical s a situation guys uh and even girls too they might have the same thing I don't know you get body swapped into Nami's body What's the first thing you're gonna fucking do? Like, come on now, come on! Even it doesn't matter the situation. Like, you're in the middle of a war zone, like being attacked from all angles. You all of a sudden get put in Nami's body. I think we all know where this is gonna go. Okay, and to be fair, at first, that's where it goes with Sanji as well. Like, the first thing he does is like, oh, boobies, fun time. Um, but. The thing that happened after that that I really found interesting and was like a big kind of like little bit of development for the character was that he gets over the pervertedness when her body is actually put in danger. And he kind of does like a flip of it where he's like, I need to protect Nami's body above all else. I need to make sure no harm comes to it. You know, and whenever he had to, whenever he was forced to do it, whenever he had to like go into the lake to get Kanemon's body back and he had to use Blue Walk and Nami's body couldn't handle that because it wasn't like as trained as Sanji's body was, he was severely worried about that. Like that was the thing he was concerned with.
you know. So yeah, I mean, you're in Nami's body. I mean, you're gonna have fun with. Yeah, I mean, it's a shonen manga. There's some things you just can't show. But I like that. I really like that. Where like Oda could have easily like the whole time Sanji was in there that he could have just had a running gag where it was just like boobies, 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 boobies. Um. But he doesn't. He kind of flips it, and he's just like, "Wait a second! I need to. I need to make sure this body is protected. I need to. I need to make sure that it doesn't get damaged. I can't be obsessed with this at this moment. I really need to stay true to my my nature." And and he does, and he does, and eventually, when they get their bodies swapped back, um, you know, Nami in Sanji's body uh, took a beating. You know, well, not like that. Well, you know, maybe I don't know what Nami did with it. But anyway, the point is, Nami in Sanji's body got really heavily beaten, and uh, when Sanji got put back into his true body, you know, he was kind of hurting a little bit from all the damage, uh, but Nami's body was pretty much left unscathed, uh, except for the whole diving into a arctic lake that was probably like, I don't know, negative 20, negative 30 degrees fucking Fahrenheit, you know, and you were down there for a while trying to find Kanemon's body, I, uh, I feel like you should probably get a little bit of frostbite there, and considering you were wearing nothing but a bikini, and yeah, but, uh, okay, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll extend disbelief, maybe Nami's a little bit tougher than you thought and you gave her credit for you know if she was no maybe she's just so her body is just so hot that it's incapable of getting hypothermia or uh or frostbite she's just immune to cold you know whatever it's about as good as a reason of anything but i did enjoy that where oda went with that thing with with uh, the the sanji body swap thing in nami oh wow but i talked i talked about that for longer than i expected but here we are Right, and, uh, wow, I talked about that for longer than I figured, but, uh, okay, it's something important, so I wanted to make sure to address it here. And I, I feel like when I address the Sanji-Nami relationship in Nami's video, I feel like there was a few things I left out, so I wanted to include here uh, as kind of my last chance. Now, here's the other thing, his relationship with Robin. Sanji does swoon over Robin, you know, in a similar way that he does with Nami, in a similar way that he does with all the other uh, females in the series that are really attractive, uh, but it, it seems like he does it a little bit differently, and, and you could always chalk that up to just Sanji knows Nami longer than he knew Robin, longer than he knew all those other girls, but I, I still feel like the way he treats Robin, a little bit different than the way he treats uh, Nami, you know, and uh, Robin's feelings toward him, you know, she does really there's really not a lot of back and forth between them it's usually just you know robin i made you this glorious you know dessert and she's like oh thank you so much sanji son but that's that's it you know there's not like a lot of like back and forth between them too much there was a few funny scenes like on thriller bark whenever sanji was combining with frankie to do the tactics 15 shit and they were asking robin to part of it and robin's like never asked me to do that again no and then sanji's like oh wait no i didn't mean to you know blah 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 um so there's some funny scenes with Robin and Sanji. I'm just saying there's not as much of like a repertoire built up between Sanji and Robin as Sanji and Nami. So yeah, he's still a pervert. He still views them both as lovely and you know beautiful women that's to swoon over, uh, just like he does with like the mermaids in Fishman Island and Viola in Dressrosa. But it seems like Nami is kind of like special with him. You know what I mean? That's that's where I'm going with that. I think he is genuinely in love with her. Um, uh, even though Stoey. In, like in Water 7 in Annie's lobby when uh, he goes to go and rescue Robin. You know, he does this in a very dedicated fashion. You know, not a lot of bullshit. Uh, he gets on the train to go after her and everything like that. But I think that's just, you know, it's because of, you know, she's also a member of the crew and I got to make sure to bring her back and everything like that because um, there's some stuff that she's not telling us and I need to bring her back and everything. And he was very dedicated to do that um, there to bring back a friend. And I think there was a moment where... Sanji did just declare, you know, like, Robin is my friend, or, or something like that, uh, of that nature, you know. Um, I can't remember who he said it to. I remember the line, uh, but I can't remember exactly who he was who he was saying it to. And I think that was also more because he was just so disgusted with how CP9 just basically used her, you know, as just, like, a prop for, like, a, like the assassination of Iceberg, and then was just gonna throw her to the fucking scaffolding. You know, he was disgusted by the way that she was treated, and he found out about her past, and he was even more disgusted by the past that she had to live, um, and everything like that. So, I, I think it's just like, I, okay, we need to bring her back, and we need to show her that it's not just all, the, the world isn't as evil as it is, that we're actually her legitimate family 
family were her legitimate friends. Uh, so that is that. Uh, then you get... See, I'm, I'm not going to go into huge detail with, like, Usopp and Frankie and, uh, and Chopper, because I think I've already kind of addressed that there. There's not, like, a super close relationship between them to the point where I really need to bring that up there. Like, there's a few cool moments between Chopper and Sanji. Like, you know, the, the big one is, of course, Sanji trying to eat him when they were on Drum Island, so that was pretty funny. There was also a scene that after, um... After Usopp was defeated by Luffy, uh, and Chopper wanted to go and, you know, heal his wounds and everything, Sanji kind of held him back, and he's like, don't, don't pity him, you know, because if you run out to him right now and you pity him, that's gonna do even more damage to his manhood than, than being defeated by Luffy, so don't do it. So there was, there was things like that, um, and with, uh, Frankie, he just kind of, you know, well, at, at first, when Sanji first met Frankie, that was during the, when they arrived on the sea train, and they, you know, he, I think he kicked him at first, like, fuck you for what you did to Usopp, but then after they realized, okay, this is the situation at hand here, he opened up to Frankie, and he's like, oh, well, that's pretty cool, you're a cyborg, that's pretty fucking awesome, uh, and then Brooke, the, the relationship with Brooke is fun, because Brooke is, uh, also as much of, like, a pervert as Sanji, but they also have a lot of similarities, because Sanji has, like, you know, like I said, he always dresses very nicely in the suits, and, like, the vests or whatever in the tie brooke also dresses in an old school like old timey gentlemanly fashion he's got the collar and everything like that um and they're both massive perverts so they're like the two perverts on the on the crew like whenever they're talking about mermaids there's the two that are like oh mermaids don't wear panties and they were like bleeding you know at the same time so they're blood brothers you see what i did there they're blood brothers oh yeah um that's cool. Also, there's a scene that I liked, and this is just, like, a minor thing, but it's, like, every, you ever notice that, like, there's, like, little minor scenes in a story that not a lot of other people might really care about, but to you, it's, like, I like that scene. I like that. That This is one of those scenes. It was on Zoe when Beige and Peckham show up, and they're, like, hey, um we need to talk to you guys. And so Sanji was up there in the trees with Brooke and Chopper and Nami, and he's looking down at Beige, and Beige's like, Come on, we need to talk about this. And and Sanji's like, just once again, really cool, lights up a cigarette, and he's like, okay, uh, Nami, Chopper, you stay behind. Brooke, you're coming with me. And there's that scene where, you know, the Chopper and Nami stay behind, and then Brooke accompanies Sanji over to, like, you know, do the talks with Beige. I don't know, I just like that scene, because that shows, like, like you know, Sanji acknowledges, like, okay, Brooke is the second strongest right after me, you know, like, we're, we can handle this, you know, us together. And I, I, I like that scene. It's something minor, it's not that important, but I like the scene like that, just a little bit of, you know, tells you about how the characters get along, and I like the relationship between them and everything like that. I, I like that. Um, but anyway, so that's the relationship there. Uh, and with Luffy, you know, I I did Luffy's discussion video, you could just go watch that, but uh, he drove him to get out of the Baratier, because Sanji was always trying to, like, I, the, when I get out to sea and I discover the world, you know, I want to find the All Blue, I want to do it, but just now's not the time, and Luffy's the one that says, yes, it's always never going to be the time unless you actually say it is. Yes, it is the time. Go. Go now. And then he kind of gives him that push that he needed. And like I said, that's probably the other 1.28% reason why he decided to go with Luffy, uh, was, was because of that you know, the push he needed. The other reason was because of Nami. Uh, maybe Sanji's just into redheads. That's just his thing. I don't think that he, I don't think he's ever run into a, another redhead in the story other than Nami. Maybe that's just his thing. Oh no, there was Carmen in the anime filler where, uh, he participates in that cooking contest in, uh, in, uh, Logtown. You know, y'all remember that? I remember that because of that bitching four kids cover. <laughs> Cook it up, yeah. It, you know, okay, I'm not gonna sing it. I'm, I'm not gonna cringe out here. Uh, we're almost, we're almost through the video. I'm not gonna cringe you out too bad, but um, go and look it up. It truly is a masterpiece of uh, the musical talents that existed in Four Kids in the early 2000s. It was really incredible. Uh, that is, cook it up. Right. Okay, so now comes to the part of the story where I go over the plot, and Sanji's been on the crew for a long-ass time, so we're gonna... This is gonna be a longer segment, but let's go through it. Alright, so I think I pretty much covered the Baratier part. Uh, the Dong Creek Pirates show up, and the first big thing we see Sanji exhibit uh, being, you know, kind and considerate to people that are truly hungry, that are truly in need of food, regardless of whether they're pirates or not, uh, Gein shows up, and he gives Gein some food, and he treats Gein like a normal human being as a opposed to everybody else treating him like garbage uh because that's you know sanji's like yeah I, I i know i know where you're coming from man i know where you're coming from and so gein thanks him and gein is legitimate i, I 
I want to see Gein again. Gein was a cool character. He really was. He's probably dead now at this point. Um, the gas probably killed him, but he was a cool guy. Now, Don, on the other hand, was an asshole, and, you know, he gets the food, and he shows up, and he wrecks the whole thing. Uh, eventually, Pearl, the, uh, like, the third mate, or, like, the second mate in, in command of the, the, the Armada, he shows up. Sanji beats the shit out of him, and then, you know, the emotional moment where Gein leaves. They give him a boat. Gein leaves and tries to go back to the Grand Line, but he's poisoned. Probably not going to survive very long. Uh, and uh, that's when Sanji decides to leave the Baratie. Luffy pushes him to leave, and they, they head out to Arlong Park to bring back Nami. Uh, because Nami, at this point, was a big part for why Nam, where, why Sanji joined. You know, he's going to fight for her there. So they get to Arlong Park. Uh, Sanji fights against Kurubi, uh, who's like a manta ray, stingray kind of fishman. Uh, and this also proves, like, his levels of endurance are just off the freaking charts, okay? So the first thing is that Kurubi punches him with Fishman Karate through a fucking wall, like through a brick wall. And then Sanji gets back up and he basically, I think, I think, um, I think that, that Karubi said something like, you know, Fishman are like 10 times stronger than a human. So this punch was like 10 times as strong as this. And Sanji gets back up and he just like takes out the cigarette and he's like, well, if those, if those punches were like level 10 or something like that, then the old geezer's kicks are like level 10,000 or something. So that just proves his level of endurance. But then when he's fighting against Karubi in the water in this giant pool that they have, that's incredibly deep, um, he grabs him and pushes him all the way to the bottom of the ocean and then all the way back up, and then all the way back down again, and the pressure is just, like, tearing him apart. He's not breathing in the process. Manages to survive long enough to breathe into Karubi's gills to get him off of him, and then Sanji still has enough energy to literally kick a giant block of cement that Luffy's trapped in underwater. I'm gonna repeat that again. Underwater, Sanji's kicks are strong enough to crack fucking concrete with just one fucking kick that's it that was cool so if you wanted an example of like the levels of his power and stamina and strength there you go right there i think something on the vin smoke family definitely rubbed off on him right um after that we get to the log town like i said new uh, not the new world the grand line or the first half of the grand line paradise uh doesn't really do much in whiskey peak pretty much just hangs out there and gets uh gets really wicked hammered and then hangs out with a bunch of girls and then passes out um little garden uh, the little garden starts a trend with sanji that i love not just the rivalry between Zoro and him, but also that whenever Sanji... You ever notice that sometimes in the middle of a serious arc when people are going around and, like, fighting everybody, Sanji just kind of wanders off to the side and does something else? That that started on Little Garden, where, you know, Luffy and Zoro and Vivi and Nami and Usopp and Karu, they're dealing with Mr. Three and Mr. Five and Miss Valentine's Day and all that shit. Meanwhile, Sanji's just wandering through the jungle aimlessly. Uh, more of a Zoro thing, honestly. Stumbles upon Mr. Three's base, gets gets, you know, on the Den Den Mushi and talks to Crocodile and then takes out the Unluckies and then he shows up again to the Straw Hats and lets them know about, you know, the the uh, the issue that's going on here. Also, a very cute moment there where he sees Nami without a shirt on, just a bra, and he, you know, at, the, at first he's like, oh, Nami's sexy, and then Nami's like, oh, how dare you, but then he's like, wait a second, Nami, dear, you need to wear a coat, you're gonna get cold, so that was also kind of a cute moment, I like that there. Um... But that, that starts a trend. That happens later on in Annie's lobby when Sanji goes off and he finds the lever to the gate of justice, which he pulls. And and, and also on Skype a little bit there, too. Uh, on Drum Island, uh, Nami is sick, so Sanji and Luffy are the ones that actually head to the castle to try to get her uh, get her help from Dr. Kareha. So that proves, you know, once again, you know, what he's willing to go through for Nami's sake, you know, and uh, you know, all the other Straw Hats hang out behind, you know, at the shore, but Sanji's the one that ch chooses to go with Luffy there. Uh, um, so that's cool. Fights against... Uh, doesn't really get a real big fight in the Drum Island arc, though. He gets injured, then he tries to fight against uh, Kuro Marimo and Chess, but it doesn't really pan out too well. He ends up ending up having to sit back and, like, recover because his spine... His spine was, like, cracked or something. It was crazy, and he still managed to, like, fight as long as he did, but he couldn't really contribute much in that fight against uh, Waffle or anybody like that. Um, we get to Alabasta, which is cool because this is another example. Like, whenever Mr. Two showed up on the ship and copied everybody's face, Faces. Sanji was below decks, and so Mr. Two never had a chance to copy his face, and so Sanji ended up fighting him in uh, Alubarna, uh, and this is really the moment where we get that Sanji just can't physically kick a woman because uh, Mr. Two has the ability to, you know, the Mani Mani Nomi can copy and go into Nami's form, her 
form and uh sanji just can't bring her bring himself to kick her no matter how like ridiculous even even though he literally knows that it's not a real woman it's not really nami it's mr two and it's just the devil fruit power even though he knows that it's like subconsciously can't do it you know there's like a cuteness bar and it's like after you pass that bar you, know, you just can't do it you know what i mean um so that, that's that on Alubarna. Uh, tearful goodbye from Vivi. I think Sanji was also very broken up that Vivi couldn't join the crew, but he understands that she has to stay on the island and be the princess and everything. Uh, we get to Skypea. Skypea is another interesting one. Normally, the trend that exists right now is that Sanji fights the third strongest, Zoro fights the second, Luffy fights the strongest, the main enemy of the arc. Uh, and this is true very much in Alabasta because, you know, Luffy fights Crocodile, Mr. Zero, Zoro. Zoro fights Daz Bones, Mr. One, and then Sanji fights Bentham, Mr. Two. Very clearly, like, Zero, One, Two. Um, we get to Skypea, and it's not actually set up like that. Uh, Sanji fights against Hattori, which is one of Eneru's priests, but he was not the third strongest priest. You know, if you we have Eneru, who is the strongest, you know, and Luffy fights him. We have Oum, who is the strongest priest. You know, Lu uh, Zoro fights him. I would say the strongest after Oum would have been, uh, would have been Shura. Uh, Shura, the guy with the the aviator vest and the in the whiplash mustache and like he uses the lance and the giant bird. I would say that would easily be the third strongest, um, you know, character in in Eneru's little entourage there. Uh, but actually, Gonfall is the one that defeats him. And then you have Hatori, which is probably the uh, the fourth strongest. And then you have Gadatsu, who is the fifth and the weakest, who was defeated by Chopper because Gadatsu was just a fucking moron. Um, but that 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 shows like a little break from it where Sanji doesn't directly fight and. He even after he fights Hattori, which is earlier on in the arc, he doesn't really get any more action after that. He uh, gets fucking electrocuted by Eneru twice uh, and manages to get back up both times. So way to go, buddy. Uh, and he helps, you know, Usopp try to disable the Maxim and everything like that. But uh, he doesn't really get a fight uh, after Hattori like that. So uh, Skypea was an interesting kind of like kind of switched up Sanji's like, you know, what he does in each arc, you know, kind of switched it up a little bit there. Um, we get to Water 7 and Eni's lobby, which I always meant. Oh, yeah, he was also the ball or some shit in the in the Davy back fight. I don't give a fuck about Davy back fight. Um, but anyway, we get to Water 7 in Eni's lobby. He fights against the Frankie family to, you know, for Usopp's sake. And then they watch the fight with Usopp and Luffy has the moment with Chopper, you know, don't even try bothering. Although after that, they do help him a little bit because it's like um, the, the Aqua Lagoon is coming. So Sanji and Chopper are kind of trying to warn Usopp indirectly that it's coming and he really needs to get to higher ground if he doesn't want to die. So Sanji still cares about him, you know. He doesn't just he's not in any mood to just disregard him as a lot of the other crew members are like well they're they're broken up that Usopp left you know Luffy and Zoro they're 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 not like happy about it but they just they just choose to keep their distance. Sanji and Chopper are the ones that are like, okay, we should still try to warn him. Uh, we get to uh, his fight with Jabra during Eni's lobby. This introduces his new power up. You know, everybody kind of gets a power up in Eni's lobby all of a sudden. Zoro gets Ashura, Luffy gets his gear second and third, and Sanji gets Diablo Jambe. I made a whole video about uh, each of those power ups. You can go check that out over here. Um, but yeah, he has the ability to light his leg on fire. And so a lot of people mentioned like maybe that's his Vin Smoke power. You know, each one of the the Germa siblings have that ability uh, to summon some sort of element, like uh, Niji uses electricity, and Yonji apparently can maybe use bacteria, Reiju can use poisons. Uh, I always confused it with Ichiji, because Ichiji used uh, what I thought was fire or like explosions. I'm like, isn't fire and explosion the same thing? And everyone's like, no, it's not! I'm like, okay, it's not! Sorry, Jesus! So, I guess, yeah, if you want to look at it, like, Ichiji is explosions, Niji is electricity, Sanji's fire, Yonji's, like, bacteria, and then Reiju is poison. There you go. There, there's your setup there. Um, but, yeah, he can spin around really fast and light his leg on fire. This works for Sanji because it's, like, his thing is cooking, so it's, like, uh, heating his leg up it makes a whole new cavalcade of techniques that he can use because, you know, heat is used so often in the kitchen to cook for food. Um, so, there you go. And then that's, that's the connection there. Um, uh, he uses that technique to defeat Jabra, who was the third strongest out of CP9, right below Luchi and Kaku. Um, Thriller Bark, you know, Thriller Bark is interesting to me. It really is, because... Thriller Bark, Sanji goes after Nami to go, like, save her after she finds after he finds out that she got kidnapped by Absalom, shows up, starts beating the shit out of Absalom, not just because he kidnapped Nami, but also because of the fact that um, uh, Absalom stole Sanji's dream to get uh, the, the clear, clear fruit, the Subi Subi Nomi. Uh, was it the Subi Subi Nomi, or was it the... Uh 
I, I, I can't remember what it was actually called. I'm just going to call it the clear, clear fruit right now. But yeah, um, Absalom ate that fruit, which allowed him to turn invisible. And that was Sanji's dream, because I think you can all know what Sanji could do with a fruit that allows you to turn invisible. Uh, but don't don't despair, Sanji. I'm sure there's another devil fruit out there that allow you to uh, peek on women. I mean, there's the Yomi Yomi Nomi. Oh, wait, no, that's by Brooke. Well, there's the Door Door fruit that uh, that Blue and O had. You could use that. To, uh, well, yeah, and actually, that, that would be I think Oda came out and said that would be like the end of world end of life as we know it. The end of privacy for all girls worldwide if Sanji got his hands on the fucking Door Door fruit. Um, yeah, th that, that would be that would be just. That would be anarchy at that point, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I'm sure maybe there's another fruit that, that could help you out there, Sanji. It's a big, wide world. You can find something. Here's the thing, though. He goes to rescue Nami, and there's some funny moments there. Whenever he's fighting Absalom, they keep getting distracted about Nami. Like, you're going down, Absalom. Oh my god, is that an angel? Oh no, it's just, oh, it's just Nami. Jeez. Wow. Okay, anyway, Absalom. Oh, jeez. Wow, really? Wow. You know, that was funny. But after he defeats Absalom, after he slams, you know, him into a fucking wall, Absalom does eventually come back and steals Nami again. You know, Sanji's carrying her away when Orz is attacking, and then Absalom shows up, grabs Nami, and then leaves, and then Sanji's like, yo, give her back, you invisible bastard. But right after this, um, Sanji just goes to help the Straw Hats fight against Orz. And I know this is an interesting... This is a... This is a rather difficult predicament you're you're dealing with here. It's like help your crew fight against a giant monster, or help Nami, who's left defenseless, being st like kidnapped by this lion dude who knows God what he's gonna do. And Sanji chose to stay behind and fight Ors. Uh, maybe now maybe he figured because Sanji because uh, Absalom was already weakened, he wasn't a threat. And Nami could take him out, which he did. Which she did. As soon as she regained consciousness, she used her climb attack to electrocute him, um, and so that worked um but uh yeah I, I i don't know i always felt that was kind of weird that sanji like after nami got kidnapped he's like oh ors like well maybe he thought well we're gonna take care of ors really quick and then we'll save nami i mean i think it would be more like in in sanji's character be like guys you can you handle ors i need to go and i need to find nami because she's still unconscious and she was kidnapped by this fucking lion guy i need to go make sure she's okay she didn't end up being okay but you know, just just something I always thought was weird. Um, Saba Ondi, not really a lot of stuff from Saba Ondi. Uh, Luffy and Zoro and Sanji all team up and they and with the rest of the Straw Hats and they take out the PX4. Uh, he gets sent away by Kuma to the Kamabaka Kingdom, which is ruled over by Ivankov. So he he does get end up sending to an island of women. So hey, Sanji, there you go. You just weren't specific in your desire, you know. Um, too bad. I, I feel like even if Kuma did ask him that, like, where would you like to go on vacation? And not, and Sanji's like, well, as long as you ask, I would like to go to the island of women. Okay. Boom. It still would have sent him to Kamabaka, and Sanji would be like, this isn't what I fucking meant! Um, but this was good training for him, if nothing else. When Ivankov showed up on the island, he's like, alright, look, um, I'll let you train on the island and learn all these rare recipes of the, uh, the Kamabaka, like, 99, you know, esoteric recipes or whatever to help out, uh, you know, build strong bodies and everything like that, but you have to defeat the 99 masters on the island, and Sanji succeeded. He succeeded in defeating all 99, uh, new Kama Kempo masters and maintaining his manhood in the process um you know he's a true man's man and uh, manages to get through it so that that and that was training that allowed him to basically ignite the fires of hell from within him whenever he desired because all he has to do now is just remember the torture he went through on that island and now he's ready to kick some ass um and this leads into the beginning of the the, the time skip where we have his little issue where he was uh he was uh constantly in need of rehabilitation because he couldn't look at a pretty girl for longer than just a few seconds without literally having a nosebleed so severe that he was in danger of dying. Um, so you have the funny moments where he's looking at the pictures of Nami like slowly like like with like a shirt on and everything to make sure to rehabilitate him back. Um, and this 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 is a major plot point up until like halfway through the Fishman Island arc until finally he notices Shirahoshi. And Shirahoshi kind of cures him a little bit. Like her beauty is so transcendent that he can't even act in the same perverted way. He literally turns to stone. Like, he's, she's so beautiful, I can't even muster a, a nosebleed because that wouldn't do it justice. It just... You know, so that that was kind of cool. Um, he fights against uh, Watatsume with Jinbei during the Battle of Yorikande Plaza, and that's when he like ignites the powers of fire inside of him, and then he uses hell memories to to defeat Watatsume. Um, 
really badass scene. Punk Hazard already talked about that with the body swapping things, you know, Sanji sexy time, whoop, whoop, whoop. I just like using that image because... I mean, come on now, who doesn't? Um, and uh, and uh, at the end of it, he fights against Virgo a little bit. This is another example of an arc, you know, where, you know, Luffy takes on the strongest opponent, Caesar Clown. Uh, well, you know, strongest is subjective here, but, you know, the main antagonist, Caesar Clown. Zoro takes on Monet, and Sanji does fight against Virgo, although I would like to say that Virgo is stronger than both Monet and Caesar Clown put together, so I think Sanji had the real battle here. Um, but Sanji couldn't fight against him for very long uh, because he was already kind of injured and then like other things got distracted you know smoker shows up and then law shows up uh but yeah i would like to say sanji fought against the strongest character in that entire arc uh that was a villain for 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 at least a little while so way to go sanji don't 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 just ignore that you know virgo was pretty strong um Dress Rosa. Dress Rosa, he meets Viola and fights against Doflamingo very briefly, but this arc is kind of cut short uh, when they have to leave and they have to go and uh, escape Big Mom's crew uh, and they become the swirly uh, eyebrowed pirates for a while. But hey, he did, once again, he fought against the strongest opponent in the arc. He fought against uh, Doflamingo and Doflamingo even said like, oh, here comes a pretty tough one. And even when Sanji is like Diablo Jambe, like Spectre, I mean like kicking him constantly in the fucking boa, you know, uh, um, not not boa Hancock, you know the the feathered boa shit that's like indestructible that bo uh, that uh, Doflamingo wears. He's like, oh, you're pretty tough, aren't you? Um, the problem is that Sanji just wasn't equipped to fight against him. You know, you know Sanji could be influenced by his strings and the parasite shit. Um, it was still easily being uh, you you can't really fight against Doflamingo in an aerial battle and expect to have home field advantage, you know what I mean? Because, like, Doflamingo's whole thing is, like, you know, strings and floating in the sky and using strings to, like, invade your body, so Sanji didn't really have any way to fight against that, but he lasted a decent amount of time. He got some pretty cool kicks out on Doflamingo, so that was sweet. Um, oh, he could fly also using uh, Skywalk, you know, the same technique that Geppo, that the CP9 guys used. Um, so then they leave, go to Zo, help fight back the the, the Kaido's uh, pirate crew, the beast pirates that were left on the island. He fights against... Uh, sheep's head and brooke is there too and he helps out fight uh, gene rummy is the, the 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 obligatory female with big tits that's on uh kaido's crew every crew needs to have a female that has big tits just that's how it goes down um and so he swoons over her for a little bit but eventually they chase them back um that's when bay J and peckham show up and then he has to come to terms with his past uh the thing that judgy wants him back is to join up with the big mom pirates get a unification thing going on there um and marrying pudding and here's here's something else that's cool is that pudding is hot very hot and sanji thinks that she's hot but even after meeting her she's he's like look you're beautiful but i can't i i have to turn you down because i i'm with my pirate crew right now so that's something else you know he's he's perverted sure but he can come back to his senses you know and, and be like okay this is what's really important here you know uh, finally get to the end I uh that's straining there I don't even know what the point of all that was because it's like I'm basically just doing a recap here but hey it's a discussion video I'm here to talk about everything I might as well just talk about fucking everything you know what I mean um, we get to Totland, uh, the arc that we're currently at right now, about to end here. Uh, the big moment of this arc involving Sanji was, of course, his fight with Luffy. Uh, kind of in the same vein as with Usopp and Luffy, except in this situation, um, it's like Luffy and, and, and Nami, they can't really tell the situation. They're not really good at reading situations. So Nami is... You know, she's seeing Sanji fight Luffy, and Sanji is right next to his brothers, like Niji and Ichiji, and they're all very clearly his brothers, because they all look the same. They all have the same eyebrow thing and, like, similar hair, just differently colored. Um, so they're they're very clearly connected, and Sanji's going off on this thing where he's like, uh, fuck you, Luffy, fuck you, Nami, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming back to the crew, I'm a prince now, badass, why would I go back with you shitty pirates when I can hang out in a palace the rest of my life? And they believe this. Like Nami, like 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 Sa like like Luffy kind of doesn't. He's like still dedicated and staying in the same spot. But Nami, um, kind of sort of buys this to the point where she's heartbroken and goes over and slaps him. Another reason why I think that she does genuinely have feelings for him, whereas. Um, she could probably think about it like this this is so out of character for Sanji this is something that he would never do but imagine if you're in love with somebody and you know all of a sudden they start saying really mean things about you like in your heart of hearts you want to believe that this is just an act 
but that still doesn't change the fact that that really genuinely hurts for them to say those things to you. And I think that's the feeling that Nami had at that moment, and so she starts kind of like getting tearing up, and then she slaps Sanji, and she stops calling him Sanji-kun. Um the honorific she usually gives him. Uh, so I think that's something else that San that Nami does have like, you know, a more, you know, more loving relationship with Sanji than she lets on initially. Uh, that she was really broken down when she when he left even though he said he would be back and then even when it's very clear like he's putting up appearances and he doesn't want them to get hurt and this was the same kind of shit that Robin pulled um, and he's acting in a way that's completely not like the way that you know him um, even even knowing all that information it still kind of hurts her that you know he would say these horrible things and and everything like that but then later on when they find out that Sanji really is you know he's the same as he always has been they just want to make sure that he doesn't like, like Sanji wants to make sure that the crew and that Zeph and everybody doesn't get injured or doesn't get killed by the Big Mom Pirates if he leaves, they're relieved. And Nami has a funny moment where she's like, I'll never forgive you as long as I live, but I'm glad that you're back, you know, that that kind of thing. And, and so Sanji's like, wait a second, did you just say you love me, kind of, sort of? And Nami's like, you know, I'll never forgive you for what you did, though, for putting me all through that worry and everything. So they're just a cute couple. I just love them. Um, okay. That's pretty much where we get to now. Uh, we get to the events during the, uh, the the wedding where, you know, he's about to be married to Pudding and they look at, you know, he looks at her eye and instead of being shocked by it, I think he genuinely says, you know, you're beautiful. That's why now Pudding is like super fucking tsundere, like, I don't love you, but I love you. Or maybe even a little bit of yandere was like, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, but I still love you. And then so she's jealous of Nami and everything like that, so... Yeah, that, that's a little bit weird with Pudding, the, the, the immediate, like, flip the switch, like, I hate you and now I love you all of a sudden, but, okay, whatever. Uh, and that brings us to the current events. Probably the most important thing that's happened recently in the manga, like in the past few weeks, is when Sanji legitimately disowns his family the same way that Judge disowned him. You know, Judge had that moment when he was a kid, he was like, Sanji, I don't, I don't want you in this family, thank God you're leaving, don't ever talk about this family again. And then he brought him back because he needed him all of a sudden, like, brushing off the used garbage and now Sanji looks him right out in his eye and he's just like fuck you old man you know I'm leaving and I'm not gonna ever you know don't ever don't ever say that you're connected to me ever again you know um, and the messed up thing about this whole thing is Sanji's brothers have no emotions. So they don't even give a shit one way or the other. You know, they're not sitting there like, don't talk to father like that. You know, they don't even care. So Judge is forced to live in a, in a, like, no love from his own children other than Sanji, who could have maybe given him some if he was a decent dad, but he wasn't. So... That's the situation. I think Judge is going to turn out to be more like Sanji than he lets on. Like, his eyebrows are going to curl in the same pattern. Sanji's eyebrows, they curl, like, asymmetrically um, in, in, the, in the opposite direction that his brothers do. So that's what makes him look like, that's what makes him unique. And I think whenever Judge takes off his helmet, it's going to be, like, opposite directions the same way as, like, Sanji's is. Um, so that's the, that's the way it goes there. I think I covered everything. I think I covered the majority. I mean, I could go into each one of his abilities, but, like, his skills are pretty much similar. They're, like, just, like, similar kicks and things. He can use observation hockey. That's the thing he's most adept at. He can use armament hockey as well. Um, that's that. He can, you know, use Diablo Jambe. Made a whole discussion video about that. So I think we're done. Ho! Oh, thanks for watching this video, guys. Thanks for sticking with me for this entire discussion on all of the Straw Hats. It was pretty badass, I have to admit. It was a lot of fun doing these videos, even if they're such a pain to film and so long to edit and everything. But I think it was worth it. So catch us back here next time where we're going to be discussing uh, Nefertari Vivi, who is like a de facto member of the Straw Hat crew for a long time, and a lot of fans really love. And then after Vivi's video, I'll get on to the discussion with the, the Straw Hat ships, uh, the Going Merry and the Thousand Sunny. And then afterwards, that's when we'll get into the, the worst generation, the next string of discussion videos regarding uh, a group of people. It'll be the worst generation. And we're going to start that one off with, uh, with uh, Eustace Captain Kids. So uh, about, uh, you know, so Vivi, then the Straw Hat ships, and then and then kids videos so that's that's the criteria for what's coming up next thanks for watching everybody remember to like and comment and subscribe all that have a good one signing out